Good evening. Uh, welcome to this uh, Riga conference uh, coffee session, I think it's called. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, the Ukrainian reform agenda uh, and European integration and the challenges uh, facing Ukraine uh, and Europe's uh, approach towards Ukraine. Uh, we have with us um, Mr. Pavlo Klimkin, the Ukrainian foreign minister, uh, on my left, and Mr. Valdis Dombrovskis, the vice president of the European Commission, uh, good evening. Good evening. Good um, Mr. Klimkin, why don't I just uh, uh, come to you first of all. I'd like to um, talk to us about the, uh, you, where, where you see Ukraine's reform, uh, European ambitions uh, at the moment. How you see the state of, of your, your plans for closer European integration. Um. Good evening again, it's great to be there, and uh, let's just cast a look outside. Uh, Riga and Latvia are a member of uh, the European Union and NATO. And we have this year and next year the same anniversary. 100 years anniversary of our independence. Latvia got it. You know, we have to go this path. So my ambition and our ambition is to create and fully to shape up uh, European and democratic Ukraine and full member of the European uh, Union and NATO. You know, Valdis knows quite well, spent uh, seven years negotiating the Ukraine Association Agreement. I was chief negotiator. And uh, the same almost 10 years on uh, getting visa free uh, for Ukraine. We have now the association agreements after all kind of, uh, you know, ups and downs now fully in force. And we are on the way forward, but we have at the same way to redouble our efforts on reforms. Because for us, reforms is not just about getting Ukraine forward. For us, it's about uh, national security and about existential sense for Ukraine. Valdis, uh, is, um, is, uh, the, is this a, a, a realistic aspiration for Ukraine to be a full member of the European Union? Well, it's uh, probably no, uh, not the short-term uh, aspiration, but in case we need uh, to continue this uh, uh, engagement with Ukraine and uh, currently use all the tools which we have available, all the uh, possibilities which uh, association agreement gives, uh, all the possibilities which uh, deep, and uh, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement gives, uh, 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 visa free sectoral cooperation, and uh, uh, by closer engaging uh, uh, economically, uh, politically, at a certain stage we can start uh, discussing so what are the next step how we can further uh, deepen our cooperation mm. i like the last phrase you like what mm. i like the last phrase you know <laughs> very well just you know for although very diplomatic and uh, anyway but uh, of course we have to say it's about us it's about us ukrainians to deliver on all the reforms already included in the association agreement and beyond because uh, our fundamental challenges is about fully reshuffling, fully transforming the system of rule of law and basically what we have still left from the post-Soviet Ukraine. But at the same time, it's about the future and it's about the beacon at the end of the road. For us, it's about EU membership because we believe uh, you know, mentality, history, everything in Ukraine is European. So we have to be there. It's our understanding uh, how we can uh, carry forward. Mm. But tell me about the, the current state of the, of the reform program. I mean, obviously, the, uh, the, the, there is a new IMF uh, review coming up. There are a number of reforms. The IMF just the other day highlighted some issues with... Uh, the anti-corruption rules and uh, the, the, the plans for an anti-corruption court, or, or which the president spoke about this week. Uh, there's the pension system, which appears to be being, the reforms there appear to be being watered down from what was originally envisaged. But can you just talk about where the current state of the reform program is right now? Uh, what, what is really important uh, is not to limit what has to be done just to our IMF agenda. Uh, 
because we have also our common agenda in the sense of uh, our interaction in the sense of macro financial assistance. But fundamentally, and our parliament uh, will have next session from Monday on, it will be about pension reforms. And pension reforms, uh, it's about people, it's about our parents, it's about us in the future. So we understand emotions, but it should be forward-looking reforms, not just in a sort of cosmetics. And fundamentally, it's the sense, the thrust of discussions. Secondly, it's about macro-financial stability, and we've been getting better you know, just three years ago. We had five billions of uh, currency reserves in our national bank. Now it's more than 18. So the progress is definitely there. And the third point, if you rightly mentioned, it's about anti-corruption efforts. Because the first stage was about building up anti-corruption system. Now we have anti-corruption bureau, anti-corruption prosecutor, police reform, the next stage should be definitely anti-corruption court because uh, you have anti-corruption bureau, you have anti-corruption prosecutor. Everybody who understands something about justice reform understands that the next stage about anti-corruption court. But it's not just about one special element taken out of the context because uh, we are now about to wrap up the reshuffle of our Supreme Court. It should not be that we have just one special court fully focused on anti-corruption issues and the whole system, you know, does not work. But fundamentally, the special, uh, the special body focused on anti-corruption is, is really important. So we have a number of fundamental challenges uh, for, uh, for coming months. As I have said, from Monday on, it's about uh, pension reforms. Uh, we uh, just two weeks ago, we approved uh, our new law of education, very important one, because it triggered our education reform. The next one, which is already under discussion, will be health reform. Because we still have a uh, health system as a mixture of Soviet system and new system. And we need simply to allocate money to... Uh, uh, to, to a concrete, you know, patient, to a human being, and not to different, uh, different health facilities. So it's just the main challenges uh, how we see it for, for you know, uh, for the future. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dombrovsky, so you've, uh, I mean, obviously, Ukraine has um, has achieved, as the minister says, quite a lot in terms of, um, certainly in terms of achieving macroeconomic stability with its reform program, but. Uh, but are you concerned about some of the drift in some of these reforms that that, um, that, that we've just been that Mr. just been discussing? Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, if you look at the overall reform uh, progress during the last uh, couple of years, uh, it has been a remarkable uh, progress. And in terms of uh, macro financial uh, stabilization, a uh, lot uh, has been achieved. Ukraine is uh, back to the economic uh, growth, so we can expect uh, economic growth around uh, 2%. Uh, budget deficit is uh, being brought under control, so next year uh, Ukraine is uh, targeting 2.4% of uh, GDP uh, deficit. Uh, currency has stabilized, inflation is down. Uh, uh, so you can see that uh, indeed uh, the macro financial stabilization has been achieved. This was also the main aim of our macro financial assistance program. Uh, we are, uh, uh, of course, uh, still now uh, negotiating the last uh, tranche uh, of the program, another 600 million euros, uh, 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 and uh, we need to uh, finalize it really uh, soon because the program is. Uh, uh, ending in the first dates of uh, January next year. Uh, then, uh, if we look at the program implementation in uh, 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 different sectors, all in all, we had seen uh, major uh, uh, progress in a number of sectors like energy, improving a, uh, a business environment, uh, 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 judiciary, a uh, uh, number of other areas. Of course, uh, uh, so it's uh, now it's uh, not only about legislation, I would say, but also about implementation of, of what has been already legislated. Uh, to give uh, some uh, examples, which we are discussing now in the context of the macrofinancial assistance program, 
uh, Ukraine has introduced a new uh, system of electronic asset uh, declarations. Uh, it has introduced uh, a register of uh, beneficial owners of the enterprises. <coughs> uh, what is uh, the next step is verification system, so that not only there are like um, declarations collected, but there's effective system of verification of those uh, uh, declarations and uh, identification of uh, possible uh, problems or uh, mismatches. So. Uh, 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 so, so what is important at this stage is to stay on course and uh, to implement those reforms which has been already uh, uh, legislated and of course to deal with the outstanding elements uh, 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 which are uh, still there uh, in terms of uh, legislative work. Is it, we, we, you, you've got um, some elections <coughs> coming up in, uh, in Ukraine over the next year or so. I mean, is it... Uh, 2019. Yes, we moved to sort of, but is it now? Is it realistic to expect? Uh, are we are you know moving into a political environment where it's going to become harder to do reforms, or uh, is, is it still? Uh, is the government still fully, um, fully energized? Look, behind? let's be uh, let's be honest. Uh, the environment uh, will become harder, not probably in the coming months, but from the next year on. Uh, because there will be kind of feeling about uh, oncoming uh, electoral campaign. So we need uh, to use uh, this fall and the beginning of next year to pull off uh, all key necessary reform I've mentioned. Valdis mentioned uh, some points uh, about uh, asset declaration. <laughs> what is really important is not just uh, kind of technical reform, it changed completely the whole mentality because uh, now you have to lay down everything and there is a way of verifying it. Not full verification so far because we've been working on it, but uh, a number of declarations uh, were already verified. For example, my declarations. And uh, we've been getting, uh, you know, all kind of messages about, you know, uh, the necessity to uh, precise different bits of information. But what, what is also important, you know, Ukraine was uh, really systemically corrupt in many spheres. For example, public procurement. Now our new public procurement system, Prozor, is, uh, you know, one of the best. You know, got uh, many important, uh, you know, nominations, including Davos or, you know, World uh, Public Procure nominations. Uh, I, I agree with Valdis. Uh, in, uh, in many areas, we've got uh, a sort of structural system, a structural framework, uh, how to be successful. And success always brings success. But we need to get better in the sense of implementation on many things. Although uh, I would say, and it's also my personal point, over the last three years, I believe we did definitely more than for the whole period of independence. Uh, and it's, it's not just about all kind of statistics you can have and uh, different kind of ratings if you see doing business. Or for example, e-governance rating. We, uh, we are now 25 position up in the e-governance rating. For, for me, you know, and I'm a big fan of that, uh, and I believe foreign ministry should become the first one fully, you know, under e-governance. Uh, it's something which definitely works. And you feel it, you know, communicating, uh, communicating with people. Uh, so uh, it's not something uh, in the sense of technical change. It's already a sense of mentality change in Ukraine. But we are not there, and we definitely have to redouble our efforts. Mm. So I, I should have asked about this, but he, well, when uh, the minister was talking about the, uh, the uh, anti-corruption court, uh, I mean, there is some, it, it, it's not clear to me whether what the European Union's position is on anti-corruption court. Is, is, mm -hmm. the, is the kind of uh, approach being taken, set out by the minister and by uh, the president last week, um, something that the European Union is comfortable with, the, 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 of, of, of the idea of not having a specialist corruption, anti-corruption court? Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, uh, we are looking at this. There is this idea to have specialized uh, uh, chambers 
uh, in court, uh, but uh, to uh, 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 be clear, the issue of um, uh, anti-corruption courts uh, is uh, uh, kind of more directly linked with the IMF uh, program. So we have uh, IMF program in Ukraine, we have uh, European Union's macrofinancial assistance program. Uh, we, of course, coordinate with uh, IMF uh, the conditions so that we don't come with contradictory uh, demands. Uh, but uh, 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 it's clear that our programs are not identical and conditions are not uh, uh, identical. Uh, so here we are talking uh, on some, some, some of the conditionality in IMF program. For example, when, when I was talking about verification system of asset declarations or beneficiary ownerships, those are conditionalities in EU's macrofinancial assistance program. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, following this because uh, one of the uh, uh, preconditions for our program is IMF program being on track. So, so in any case, there is uh, this interlinkage. Mm -hmm. um, Minister, you mentioned the education reform just now. Um, uh, you know, you, the, that education reform obviously caused quite a lot of controversy elsewhere in Europe with some of European countries um, uh, taking, uh, objecting to some of the, the clauses in it, particularly the ones around language teaching. Uh, I mean, are you, I mean, what's the, um, uh, do you think that they're, that they're they misunderstood, or is there a, they're, they're wrong to do so? Or uh, I mean, what, what, what's the thinking behind that reform? Uh, firstly, this reform is fully in line with our international commitments. Uh, I'll get you a simple example of uh, of the current situation. Uh, the year before, I visited Hungarian consulate in uh, Transcarpathian. Uh, you know, pulled down to greet the people uh, in the area where people uh, get, uh, you know, consular, consular services. Greeted the people and some of them were not able to greet me back in Ukraine and simply say good morning. Fundamental point is not to limit or restrict education in languages of national minorities. It's definitely not our point. It's important for people, it's important to, for, for their national identity. Our point is that a number of subjects should be taught in Ukrainian, because otherwise people, you know, Ukrainian citizens of Hungarian descent or Romanian descent are discriminated. They can't enter Ukrainian universities. They can't uh, get position in Ukrainian civil service. They can't uh, enter Ukrainian politics. They can't serve uh, in Ukrainian military. So in a way, they are doomed uh, to spend time in their, in their area of, of living. And because of that, uh, they are not in a way uh, full members of our, of our society. And of course, uh, uh, the issue about uh, language and about education is, uh, is a point of national security. <laughs> you know, just yesterday I sent uh, this law uh, to the Venice Commission for international expertise, of course, because it's important. And we are in a dialogue with, uh, with our neighbors. But uh, fundamentally, the idea of this law is not to restrict someone, but expand opportunities for everyone in Ukraine. And it should be done this way because uh, it's the only way how to engage everyone, how to make everyone active uh, within, uh, within the Ukrainian society. It's as simple as that. Mm. Well, it's obviously, I mean, here in Latvia, you, you know, you, I'm not, you know, we, is a, a country where language is also a sensitive issue, so maybe you have some sympathy with the Ukrainian position. But uh, but what um, do you do? You, clearly, this is a problem on the European side. The, the Hungarian government talked about uh, this with the, this if Ukraine persisted with reform, it would hurt Ukraine. What's uh, I mean? Is this is this an issue for 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 Ukraine's European perspective? Uh, well, uh, certainly uh, what is needed at this stage is uh, to have a, a, a dialogue between Ukraine and uh, EU, especially the uh, member states which have been uh, uh, expressing uh, 
uh, uh, con uh, 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 concerns and to see uh, whether uh, this uh, issue can be uh, clarified. I think uh, Mr. Minister, uh, Minister outlined the aims of the uh, uh, reform. Uh, 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 we uh, uh, must see what are the real uh, concerns of the uh, countries which are expressing the concerns and see uh, uh, how uh, this can be uh, uh, addressed. So, uh, uh, main thing is here uh, is uh, uh, indeed to have a, a dialogue and uh, and uh, uh, f find a solution which uh, is uh, at the end of the day not uh, problematic because I believe we can uh, share uh, the objectives expressed by the minister. Um, there's a the Eastern Partnership Summit coming up later this year. Um, it's been noticeable since the Riga summit that the EU has been unable to use the same wording about Ukraine's European perspective uh, in the same way. But what um, what would you hope would might what what would you hope would come out of this this, this the Eastern Partnership Summit? Uh, look, firstly, I believe. Uh the Eastern Partnership is not about European perspective. It's a framework of cooperation. And we have very different countries within this framework. Now we have Moldova, Georgia, and us with uh, association agreements and enjoying visa free with the European Union as very important first step. So, in a way, we are in the process of advanced associations. Our vocation to become in the future members of the European Union, but also our challenges in the sense of uh, oncoming reforms are completely different from other countries. It does not mean that we don't need this format in the sense of uh, connectivity, in the sense of transport, uh, in the sense of energy links. So there are a lot of issues we could and we should discuss in the format of six. But key issues about European integration, about European reforms, should be styled in a special way, either bilaterally or in a different format. Otherwise, it simply doesn't make sense. And many people expect from the, uh, from the summit a kind of declaration on uh, European perspective of the lack of declaration, and uh, it feeds a kind of discussion. I believe the summit is not about that. The summit is about coming up with a clear set of tools for the future and we have now of the region uh, proposed by the European Commission, so-called 2020 vision, about new tools needed to advance our association. And uh, it's about financial tools, it's about supporting our reforms. Uh, so many, many good ideas. But, of course, uh, we need also to bridge uh, these two years, uh, 2018 and 2019, because uh, it's quite a period. And we need to find ways to gain, gain momentum also tomorrow and after tomorrow, not just from, uh, from 2020. On the top of that, I believe uh, that Ukraine and Georgia and maybe Moldova also need uh, security-related cooperation with the European Union. It's about security and safety of borders, it's about internal security, it's about countering Russian propaganda, it's about cyber security, hybrid threats, many important issues. So it's difficult to discuss these issues within the Eastern Partnership framework because we have countries like Belarus, and Moldova, we have countries like uh, Armenia and Ukraine. Uh, so my point about the Eastern Partnership, uh, it's a useful framework so far for a number of, uh, of important uh, ideas to be tackled. But big issues like European perspective, uh, 
like what we have to do in the sense of advancing our situation. Security related cooperation should be tackled basically separately from, uh, from this dimension. In a way, uh, it's not about managing expectation in the run-up to the summit. It's about being honest and clearly understanding what is needed in the sense of our interaction with the European Union. So in a way, we already have uh, profound diversification within the Eastern Partnership, and we have to address this diversification. So a new, you're saying, a, a, a new format or a new... No, we can we can do it bilaterally. So uh, <laughs> we we uh, we should not discuss uh, formats for the sake of formats. Coming up with new formats, saying uh, here we need new format, here we need something bilateral. Otherwise, our discussion will be focused just on formats on something else, and we will uh, keep spending a lot of time on kind of virtual discussions. Let's get practical within the Eastern Partnership. It's about very practical sense. It's not about big politics. And uh, we all understand uh, that European perspective uh, is, is difficult to deal with uh, within the frame of the Eastern Partnership because it's comprehensive how you can provide European perspective to all six countries. And some of them simply w don't want any European perspective. So let's be, uh, let's be fair on what, could, uh, what, what we could, could do within the Eastern Partnership and what should be uh, tackled clearly beyond. Well, on this, uh, n uh, indeed, and uh, uh, Eastern Partnership countries are uh, quite uh, 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 different uh, and also quite uh, uh, different in uh, their relations with uh, EU. There are uh, countries which are uh, uh, having uh, uh, European aspirations, or uh, at least had expressed uh, European aspirations at certain uh, uh, stages, like uh, Ukraine, like Moldova, like uh, Georgia. Uh, there are countries um, which so far had not been uh, expressing uh, European aspirations, like Belarus, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, there are also different levels of engagement, different levels of interest and commitment uh, to cooperation uh, with the EU. Uh, so that's why we developed this concept uh, uh, more for more, that uh, we are not seeking some kind of uniform solutions across the Eastern Partnership, but indeed are engaging more deeply with those countries which are uh, uh, willing to do so and are also ready to uh, uh, implement the necessary reforms, do uh, uh, necessary adjustments to ensure this uh, deeper uh, engagement. And that uh, is a concept which has been, uh, I'd say, uh, quite uh, successfully uh, functioning within this uh, 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 within uh, uh, Eastern Partnership, but of course it also means that uh, uh, on a number of uh, cases then we need to go down to the uh, uh, questions of bilateral uh, cooperation to see how uh, deeply each individual country is uh, willing to engage with EU. And, and is there, are there ways in which the EU could engage more deeply with Ukraine uh, the minister talked about the, uh, the, the two-year gap needs to be bridged, but also, you know, outside of a full European membership perspective, are there aspects of EU of the EU that could be open to Ukraine? There's Schengen, the customs union, single market, the banking union. I mean, could could Ukraine uh, could could some of those be uh, viable options for Ukraine? Well, uh, at this stage. Uh uh, of course, we need to uh, uh, consolidate what has been already uh, 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 achieved, so to implement uh, uh, association agreement which has just recently fully entered uh, uh, into force to uh, use a, a trade agreement and uh, first results we think are uh, uh, quite positive. In the first quarter of this year, trade with Ukraine has increased 25% to compare with the same uh, period last year. Uh, uh, as of October, we'll be coming with new additional trade uh, preferences for, for Ukraine. So 
improving unilaterally uh, access uh, to uh, for certain products to the uh, EU uh, market. Uh, we are developing uh, sectoral cooperation in a number of areas. Uh, after the recent uh, cyber attacks against Ukraine, we also uh, are ready to engage on uh, uh, deeper in a cooperation as regards uh, uh, cyber, cyber security. So we need now uh, to house this deeper practical engagement and uh, uh, then we can see what new formats we can uh, 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 open for, uh, for uh, further uh, engagement. That, that, does that sound good to you, Mr? Well, it's, uh, it's a good way forward, but uh, I believe we need to be ambitious. We need to uh, explore what is possible and what is needed. Mm -hmm. For countries like Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, uh, maybe some other countries uh, could be satisfied with what is already on the table within the Eastern Partnership. For us, it's not enough. Because uh, uh, to implement association agreements is not uh, a technical exercise. It's not about creating metrics, you know, writing down, of course, uh, all the time frames and simply going along. It's about being focused on reforms which should lead us towards the European Union. It's our goal. And the whole sense of any association agreements is exactly that. Uh, whether we can uh, come up with political messages today or tomorrow or after tomorrow, it's a different issue we have to tackle on a different track. But I believe we need new tools, we need additional financial resources, of course, to uh, successfully implement association agreements in what is already needed in our relations. Because uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> our free trade agreements uh, are called deep and comprehensive free trade agreements. So it's not about playing with tariffs, it's all about WTO. Our agreements is about taking over EU legislation and, uh, of course, gradually, but becoming part of uh, EU freedoms, becoming part of the EU common markets. And it's our ambition, because we believe uh, that at the end of the day, FTA is about investment. It's about uh, Ukrainian companies becoming uh, important links in the supply chains of European companies. It's about common market. And it's not about uh, simply, you know, getting tariffs a bit higher or getting tariffs a bit, uh, a bit, uh, a bit down. So fundamentally, we need a very ambitious approach uh, for, uh, to this implementation. And uh, we have to work on that. So including access to membership of EU regulatory agencies? Uh, all kind of sectoral policies. Mm. Of course, we can't embrace all the sectoral mm. Mm, policies right now. <laughs> the text of the Australian agreements is about 2,000 pages. Of course, uh, part of them is about FTA, is about tariffs, but it's a very detailed synopsis of what we have to do together. Mm. Of course, uh, the fundamental burden and fundamental challenge of delivering reforms, it's, uh, it's on us. It's about Ukraine delivering this reform. But uh, the experience of implementing these agreements uh, by EU member states shows uh, that uh, it's, it's about common effort. Uh, and engagement on different sectoral policies uh, is very important. S you know, some, uh, it, it could be about digital market. I told you that we are 25 position ups. Uh, it could be about energy union. It could be about new proposals because security and defense uh, are really important for us. So, but we have to be comprehensive and ambitious here. So it sounds as if uh, from the Ukrainian point of view, what, what, what the EU is putting on the table isn't the moment doesn't sound like it's going to, it, it, it's enough. Isn't there a danger that uh, 
if the EU can't be more ambitious, that it um, uh, that it that it uh, uh, politically un you know raises the political cost for the reform agenda in uh, in in Ukraine, that uh, uh, it takes away some of the political support for the tough things that the, that the EU is asking Ukraine to do? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, EU has uh, acknowledged Ukraine's European uh, aspirations. That was also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the conclusions of uh, uh, Riga uh, summit. Uh, and uh, 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 we are working on this uh, basis. So the question is how quickly we can make uh, uh, progress. And uh, we probably cannot, you know, jump over uh, stages of uh, uh, integration and uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, we need to develop certain uh, track record of working uh, together, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, establishing those uh, closer ties. And then exactly as uh, 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 Minister Clinton said, uh, uh, looking uh, also when is the right moment for further, you know, uh, political steps, political uh, declarations. So now I'd say we are in the, at the stage of technical uh, work. Uh, 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 in terms of uh, 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 political costs, of course, we understand uh, uh, reforms, especially as uh, deep uh, uh, reforms as uh, Ukraine has been uh, undergoing in recent years, they help uh, political costs. So we keep this uh, engagement and uh, uh, the very fact that we are now uh, done with association agreement that Ukraine uh, citizens can travel visa free to uh, uh, EU, uh, that we uh, 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 continue financial assistance, that we uh, 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 continue to uh, uh, support uh, uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine, that we are prolonging sanctions against uh, uh, Russia. Uh, this uh, all, I think, uh, uh, plays in uh, uh, also uh, to uh, see, uh, uh, to, to convince also public in Ukraine that uh, EU is standing with Ukraine and is uh, supporting Ukraine. Uh, we're, we're, we're coming towards the end now, Mr. but, but uh, you've mentioned um, borders and security. Uh, I mean, again, is the uh, uh, is the relationship with the EU working well in terms of helping Ukraine with its security and border issues, or uh, you've got a, uh, is there more that you would like the EU to be doing to to help you in in, yeah, in, in, the, in the war? That definitely, it's working well. We have a number of very positive examples. For example, the famous EU bomb mission, which is aimed at controlling trafficking uh, around Transnistria which is definitely a black hole. But at the same time, uh, we need to do more because we need to extend this positive experience. We have quite a border with Russia and it's uh, the source of threat. And of course, it's not about EU fighting at this border, but it's about EU helping us to build up our capacity there. So, in a way, <coughs> it's about internal security, and we have uh, EU AM mission, and uh, the operational sense of this mission is very important. Training our prosecutors, training police, uh, you know, building up our internal capacity, very important. But it's also about fighting against cyber threats, uh, it's about fighting uh, Russian propaganda, and here, I believe, the European Union could definitely do more, and we need to use uh, the synergy in a very effective way. Here in Riga, we have uh, NATO Strategic Communication Center, and uh, now we have also NATO and European Union interacting quite effectively on that. And Ukraine should be a part, an indispensable part, of all these efforts. Why? Because I believe uh, we learned a lot in these three and a half years fighting the Russian aggression. It was about uh, Russian viruses, uh, including uh, electricity retail facility, including our banking system. It was about all kinds of waves of propaganda. It was about terroristic activities. So we understand now the nature of hybrid threats 
And I believe uh, I understand what I'm talking about in a completely different dimension. And here we have fundamental assets, which is important for us because it's our asset, but also for the European Union. The, I mean, the Ukrainian border, in many respects, is the Europe is the European border. I mean, is there, uh, do you agree that there's that there's more that the EU could be doing to to uh, work with Ukraine to defend that border? Uh, well, uh, certainly uh, we uh, uh, can uh, engage uh, uh, deeper and as already mentioning that, for example, in an area of uh, uh, cyber security, uh, uh, we are willing to engage uh, uh, deeper. It has been uh, discussed also during the recent EU-Ukraine uh, summit and uh, certainly uh, we can uh, uh, engage uh, 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 deeper in area also of uh, 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 border protection, in areas of uh, customs, in uh, uh, other uh, areas. Uh, so this is indeed then uh, down uh, to the practical uh, work, agreeing on practical cooperation formats and actually working on them, uh, implementing them. We're running towards the end. Do you have any last thoughts, Minister? You on uh, uh, any any, uh, any your your hopes for the next uh, well for the from the, at this summit and uh, um, in terms of your your engagement with people here? What, what's your uh, uh, in the run-up to the summit, my hope is very clear. We need to come up uh, with a number of practical tools to support uh, reforms in Ukraine. But beyond that, I believe uh, we need also uh, you know, new quality of uh, common engagement. Because uh, our border is now a European border. <laughs> Ukraine uh, becoming fundamentally the eastern flank uh, of Europe, if not formally the European Union. And uh, I'm absolutely convinced that in the future, the moment will definitely come where we will start talking about uh, new political perspectives. So we have to start now working practically on these political perspectives and transforming Ukraine in the sense of uh, European and democratic future of our country. Minister, thank you very much. Mr. Thank, thank you. you very much. It indeed. was a pleasure. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.